in the PR or not. Uh, All right. If we have quick consensus on how to change it, that's fine. But otherwise, we can just say no consensus. All right. Uh, over to you, Harold. Issue 1896, PR 2071. Okay, this was discussed at the previous meeting. Uh, and I finally got to write a PR on it. Uh, it's not it's not addressing everything because uh, I found that I, I had a missing piece. I don't know where in the document to put uh, stuff that says, this stuff might happen while the call is going on. Then you should do the following. I think I'll, uh, I have, have to add that. But the PR uh, 2071 is just saying that uh, when your encode reads, you uh, you put them in the in the same order as in as, as in the list of encodings, and when you decode them, you you produce a list of encodings that are is in the same order as uh, as uh, the stuff from the from the STP. I did find another. This section is missing is you, which is that there isn't a section that says how to create. Uh, uh, how to create a sender from from a, a description. Uh, we'll get back to that at the end of the meeting. So that, does uh, PR2071 seem, seem like the right thing? I think so. Uh, looks fine to me. Um, yeah, my only question, Harold, was about your note on the what layer gets dropped first. Is your intention to file a separate issue on that? I will. OK. So uh, any objections to what Harold has proposed in PR 2071? Sorry, just a clarification. I think I yeah. Um, so the, the order of the, so you're talking about the M section, right? Um, so is it the order of RIDs in the A RID lines or the, the order of RIDs in the A simulcast line? I think it should be the simulcast line. Uh, it's, the way I wrote it is the way order of RIDs in the A RID line. I think it should be the same order in both places. Is there a problem? Um, as long as, so forcing them both to be the same order is probably too much and rather than saying just one of them. Is the is the definitive order, and I would say the simulcast layer because that at least is somewhat similar to the spec of simulcast, where the order of the layers are in preference from left to right, mm. and then just whatever they reference any RIDs, and that's fine. Does that make sense? It's the same thing. Just say I'm saying that. Let's make sure that we're saying the order in the simulcast line. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you take note of that, Henrik? Right. Yes. Okay. I think we're done with this one. Okay. Next one is issue 1964, uh, the effect of send parameters on simulcast. Um, so this is the send parameter dictionary. Um, with respect to the things in here, degradation preference affects the preference between resolution and frame rate. Um, one question which is not addressed in the PR is, does this affect the order in which simulcast streams or layers are dropped in it within a sender? Um, do people have any opinions? For example, if you say prefer maintain resolution, does that somehow affect what occurs uh, when layers and or simulcast streams get dropped? Uh, considering you said the, the, the bandwidth can be allocated, uh, that how the bandwidth is allocated is up to the user agent, wouldn't that imply that uh, it's up to the user agent which one to drop as well? Well, that's one interpretation of it. Um, because degradation preference is about maintaining frame rate versus uh, resolution, um, I've heard it interpreted in many different ways for many different purposes, including content hints. So uh, I think maybe the right thing to do is to probably leave this to a separate issue, the order issue, which uh, I guess Harold has talked about. Uh, maybe we can clarify that there. So far, this isn't in the PR. Um, 
priority affects the allocation of bandwidth and basically uh, the PR says the user agent is free to allocate bandwidth between encodings of an RTP sender so um, essentially uh, the, the priority does not affect that um, and then we have the encoding parameters and uh, the individual members are defined in section 526, but uh, PR 2073 does clarify the following, that the user agent is free to allocate bandwidth between encodings as long as the max bit rate or the max frame rate isn't exceeded. Um, one question which came up with max frame rate is uh, whether this is valid for a stream with a kind other than video. Uh, currently it assumes that it is. It doesn't say it's only for video. I guess uh, you can interpret that as the number of uh, audio samples, I guess, in the case of audio. I agree with that. Simulcast in no way is, is uh, restricted to video. No, that, that we all agree. Uh, the, the only question is whether max frame rate has a meaning for something other. Oh, for max frame rate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Currently, it kind of says that it does. But uh, anyway, uh, we can leave it as it is. Uh, and a corollary of this is that none of these parameters affect what streams are dropped first. <laughs> they don't allocate bandwidth. So, wouldn't your definition of max frame rate for audio relate to P time? In a way. Uh, well, currently in the draft, it doesn't. It, for some of the things, it says that they're explicitly uh, audio or video, but max frame rate doesn't say. Uh, it doesn't explicitly say it's only for video. So. Um, I guess it's it's uh, it doesn't say that in the draft right now. It doesn't say much of anything. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure whether in the case of audio, how you would interpret max frame rate. Is it the number of samples? Does it relate to peak time? I don't know. I think that's a separate issues from uh, clarifying the simulcast. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, do, do people think there is an issue there worth fi filing? What what max frame rate would mean in the case of audio? I believe it might be better to have it only for video, and have an ex. If we get uh, asked for the feature, then we can rethink of it uh, later, or maybe add a new field for audio specific um, use case. I had assumed there was video only. Yeah, that's kind of what I assumed, and then I reread re it, and I was a little bit surprised to to uh, realize that it didn't say that. Okay, uh, uh, can you take a note, Henrik? Uh, open a potential issue on max frame rate, whether it's video only. Yeah, I wrote down for degradation preference and dropping layers if, uh, to file an okay. issue and uh, to max frame rate. Okay, thank issue. you. But uh, do we have consensus on what's actually uh, in PR 2073? Um, which is everything other than that. I think so. Or okay. I agree. All right. OK, so we'll move on. Uh, Yanivar. Uh, yes, yeah, so this slide is uh, uh, pretty much unchanged from last. Uh, this is something we decided last time. So the only difference here is that we have a PR. Um, uh, briefly, the issue was that um, there wasn't really clear language on when information uh, when you get codecs from get parameters. Uh, it was a little unclear uh, if that was live. And since get get parameters is synchronous, it would be nice to add some internal slots. So we added a PR that adds internal slots for send codecs and receive codecs. And these are set in uh, basically set answer, which would be set remote description answer or set local description answer, depending on what side you are. And which would mean that uh, you would have to wait for uh, set, you know, the answer to be set to be able to read codecs out of get parameters. And the PR is on the next slide. Um, so basically, other than the boilerplate for creating the internal slots, uh, the core language would be in a set description, which is, uh, you know, it turns out there is actually not a single place to, uh, to uh, uh, add information for answers. So I had to add it in two places. And that was already being done for uh, related things. So um, it's something we could clean up later, perhaps. So uh, in short, then, um, 
if this is answer or PR answer, then we set the send codex to the codex that description negotiates for sending and which the use agent is currently capable of sending, which was similar language from where it lived before. And the same for receiver, receive codex to the codex that the description negotiates for receiving and which the use agent is currently prepared to receive. And that's it. Would there be any usefulness and in being able to to get parameters between uh, setting a remote offer and and setting the local answer. Right. So this is the common issue we have with the asynchronous offer answer exchange is that um, traditionally we we expose some information uh, early when as soon as you set a remote description offer. Like for instance, you create all the transceiver objects if they don't exist any, uh, already, which makes sense. <clears throat> and a lot of that had to do with this was an API meant so you can interrogate um, this during negotiation and react to it. And uh, the downside of that, so we have some things that are exposed uh, early, including like um, uh, we fire the track events and stuff early. Uh, and I think looking back, the reason for that was so that you, it used to be that for tracks, Tracks used to be the objects that you um, rejected endlines with, which it no longer is. So there's a lot of legacy there. Uh, I don't know that. Um, well, yeah, I guess that's a question for everyone if they would need codex during the negotiation. In order to my, my, out. my concern is if you want to use set parameters to change what you're sending. Right. Uh, if you have to wait before the answer to do set parameters because you don't have access to get parameters, mm -hmm. uh, then you would have this sort of short period of time where you're sending the wrong thing only to change it you know, as soon as yeah. possible later. The difficulty here, though, is then would probably end up with having to figure out current versus pending again, mm. perhaps. And also uh, a lot of trends. Transport objects, for example, don't exist until answer. So this yeah. is a long-standing issue about where um, where these things should start existing. Or when settings, when when is the negotiation done? Basically, is the issue, right? So can we? So what's the simple thing to do? Well, can we can we uh, merge this and file an issue about whether or not we want to support? It early as a separate issue. Okay, that sounds, that sounds good to me. That just sounds like another clause right. for this. Right. Yeah, yeah I guess. Um, and a second issue, Henrik, would be. Uh, uh, I think the issue came up about what about header extensions and other stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think we should probably do the same. We we probably have the same issue as uh, for codecs with header extensions. Right. So if we have a solution for codecs, we should just extend it to header extensions. That would seem the natural thing to, to do to me. Yeah. I agree. I noticed that while writing the PR. That it seemed to make okay. sense. So you can take take note of that, Henrik, in the resolution. Okay. We'll open issues for that. OK. Uh, issue. The consensus is to merge this, right? Yes. Oh. And, uh, oh, yeah, and then it's my issue. So this is another old old one that we discussed at the the TPAC, but uh, we have these uh, codec preferences, and you you set them in the offer, you you also set them in the answer, and and uh, uh, this is just to clarify that it's intentional that if if both the offer and the answer has have codec preferences, then the answer's codec preference overrides the offer's or the the one that's in the SCP. Yeah. Whereas if if you don't if the answer doesn't have a codec preference, then you will use use the same order as was in the offer. Mm -hmm. And it's added as a note in this PR, so it doesn't change any of the steps. It just clarifies. Any objections to what Henrik's proposing here? Okay, you can note, Henrik, that uh, PR is, uh, has consensus. Right. Okay, uh, issue 2013 um, and PR 2067. This is uh, an issue about uh, valid read 
values, mm -hmm. and there's a mismatch between IETF specs uh, and also between the W3C. So there was a material in section 5.1 where we actually had our own grammar in there, uh, which conflicted with draft IETF M music RID. Um, there's also a potential conflict with the AVTX RID spec. Uh, but basically, in PR 2067, we've changed this, removed the, the text of section 5.1, and just cited draft IETF M music RID. Um, and I posted a note to the RTC web list, and they're arguing about which uh, grammar is appropriate in the ITF, but that's no longer our problem. Uh, so the consequence is that you can only use one uh, character. Uh, well, it, it's, we're basically citing the M Music document. That could change right. uh, as a result of the ITF discussion, but it's, it wouldn't be a problem for us. <laughs> it would no, no, no. still be a problem for implementers to figure out what it's supposed to be, but uh, let the ITF sort it out. Yeah, it's uh, the one star means at least one. Yeah, and it, I think I think uh, they really should write one star sixteen. But that's uh, right. Quite, they, yeah. they were discussing that as well. Yeah, but uh, the okay. point is, we're just referencing whatever it is they figure. Actually, we should probably send them a note to just say, "Hey, get it. make a decision, get on with it, please." Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> anyway, any uh, any objection to this uh, solution to the issue? No, sounds good. Okay. Uh, Amit, issue 2014. Yes, okay, so um, it's not clear how to set the number of layers when answering an offer with a track. So basically, um, uh, you should not be using um, add track because add track doesn't allow you to specify the number of layers. Um, so in simulcast, if you are the um, the one who's actually sending, but the offer is coming from the server and not from not from you, then um, what you need to do um, is um, in the add transceiver, right? Uh, you you can specify the layers. So um, the transceiver will be created for you, and then. Before um, you call, and then you call get parameters to get the parameters. Um, it'll have the encoding layers that are set from the offer, and you can just change the parameters using set parameters. Um, does that make sense? Was that clear? I makes sense to me. I think that's perfectly clear, and it's the same thing I concluded when I when I this filed the uh, twenty seventy two. Uh, yeah. So there's one little bit. <clears throat> Detail. Uh, um, I, have, I have a question there. Yeah. If you're the um, if you're not if you're the answerer, um, isn't there already a transceiver? Don't we want to use that one instead of calling add transceiver? Yeah. So, so, so that's when you're a problem I found in the in that when you when you look for which transceiver to use, you didn't. We don't have language that says uh, check the num that the number of encodings fits. Right. So when you're the answer, you're not going to call add transceiver. But right. a transceiver might be created for you even if there's a transceiver that, um, or there's an M section that can be recycled just because of the um, problem with the mismatch in number of layers. Right? Because you can't change the number, you can't change the envelope. Right. Right. So do we need to add a uh, add language for how to recycle simulcast transceivers? Can that be at the at the um, discretion of the um, platform agent, whatever we're calling it? I think we should aim for consistent behavior. And I, if if we just add the line saying that. Uh, the number of transceiver, the number of layers has to be at least so the equal to the number of red li red lines. Then, right. Then we should, yeah, we should be fine. Okay. So would that be a separate issue or uh, this issue to say recycling? Yeah, let's find a new issue for it. There's no public to this one, right? right? No, 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 yeah. I haven't created any for mine. Uh, I'll create them all 
No worries. I said, so are, we, uh, are, we, are we saying that we only reuse a transceiver if you've already added one with that number of encodings? Um, well, we're not really saying that, but that is probably how we will be um, doing this. And the, there was a, and the request is to add language that will say something similar to that, that a transceiver can only um, reduce the, no, that we can't change the number of layers in a transceiver. Uh -huh. right. So otherwise, it'll, we'll add a new transceiver if we don't already have one with the correct number of sending codings. Correct. If we don't have okay. one to reuse, yes. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. So that that was that was the one thing that needed to go here. That if you get an offer that specifies a specify an M line with uh, three hundred and twenty layers, and you can only support five, then the result should be a transceiver with five layers. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's I think we already said that somewhere. I think yeah, client can reduce the number of layers but not increase it. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So you twenty seventy two is really a duplicate by this time. All right. We'll get back to that. Okay, Jan Ivar, issue twenty twenty three. Yeah, again this was uh discussed before uh last meeting. Uh so uh the only difference is there's a PR now and it just removes get default ice servers. Um no browser currently supports it. And the background there was that uh, it probably existed in the spec. Um, basically, nobody wants it, and I think it was a. Uh, it looked like a comprom. It was a compromise that looked like what multiple parties wanted, but that was not the same. So, so Yanavar, um, uh, you know, I, um, we still want it, and the the reason is the following. And and look, I I, I I'm not I mean, I, I'm not arguing about eating, adding or deleting as implementing, but I think it would be good for the browsers to implement. Here's why. Um, the, the simplest implementation would just be you read a config off disk um, that's in the configuration for the browser or however browser configuration policy is currently provisioned into the browser um, by enterprises in particular. And if it's there, then you return that string. Apps can ignore this. It doesn't automatically go into the ICE servers or anything. It just returns the string, that's all, and then apps can use it if they want to. And the place where this is really useful is there are lots of enterprises where WebRTC is totally blocked in and out. But if it would, could run through um, an enterprise provided turn server, then it would continue to work in those types of environments. It would be allowed through the firewall with that turn server. And it also um, has privacy, you know, strong privacy preferences of it allows you to provide your own turn servers instead of routing all of your traffic through basically um, other people's turn servers. Um, so, and it's, it's obviously really easy to implement as well. Um, so we're, we're sort of curious why no one's implemented it and whether that could be prioritized up. And, and the idea that no one wants this is just does not seem true at all. I mean, we've been discussing this with Firefox for a long time. I'm surprised to hear you say no one wants it. Um, well, to me, it's just to me, this sounds like trying to get the browser to, to solve a, a application-specific problem. Like, you could get the config from elsewhere than uh, an API inside the browser. OK, I'm open to ideas there. What do you got in mind? I mean, you can you can read the the address from from somewhere else, right? Yeah, but the browser. But the, this is I'm I'm going to poke you on it exactly where somewhere else because part of the guarantee that the browser tries to make is it doesn't allow you just to read from some generically configurable local IP address or something. Like if we could read from you know a DNS SD address of you know turn server dot local, right? Like. We could do that, but we can't. That's exactly what the browser blocks us from doing is accessing data inside an enterprise for good reason, right? So, I mean, I'm open to other ideas on how to solve this, but it'd be really good to solve. OK, I, I, I don't have a strong opinion on it. And, um, and I may have um, misinterpreted the, uh, I, well, I know I did misinterpret. I thought get default ICE servers uh, was supposed to fit Firefox's existing implementation where you can specify turn servers that uh, will happen under under your you know unbeknownst to the website and so well, there's a difference between the variable right if Firefox only implements the variable but not get default i servers is that right well what Firefox implements is is well um, what we're looking at here in the spec is an opt-in right where the app yeah. 
would opt in to use this. It's just extra information that the browser can optionally provide, which is not what Firefox had. Firefox had something that you can configure. The user could configure their browser to do this on any website if they wanted. Right. And even instead of the web website's chosen turn server. So, so I interpreted that mismatch as that this was a, not a desired API. So I'm, hap uh, you know, I'm happy to reconsider that. And uh, we can uh, not merge this PR and discuss. Well, at, at worst, though, we, if we don't merge the PR, we need to describe what how things work, because there was considerable disagreement on exactly how it was all supposed to function. Uh, so well, we'd at least I, have to describe exactly what it, what it does. Uh, well, I, I think it's clear that it would do nothing by default other than return something that an app could read out, and then it would need to, if they wanted to use it, they would have to reinsert that into the configuration of the mm -hmm. pair connection. Yeah, I, I think that that was exactly the design that was discussed at some point in time. I maybe you know I I'm, I'm not claiming other things haven't been discussed, but that, that's the only one that I remember. <laughs> I mean, this would be a fingerprint, obviously, and uh, right. So yep. An application that wanted to do this would yeah. There's fingerprinting, and there's also the issue. Uh, do you trust the list of default i servers? So does the web app trust the this list of i servers, or does it not trust it? How how can it know that this list is to be trusted, is to be used, or is not to be used? Really, so what will do the web app there? Well, what do you mean by trust? What would there be not to trust about the turn server? All the traffic still encrypted over, it. and the the user is explicitly telling you here, here's what I want, and I think that that point leaves it up to the web app. That's why it's optional. They can call this string or not, and they get a value back from it, and they can decide whether they want to insert that in their list of turn servers or not. It's up to them. The, the user in Firefox is able to um, set the list of servers, and it's uh, in the Chrome. It's not uh, controllable by the web app. So uh, right. the user said, I trust these I servers. So the web app should say, OK, uh, the user already trusts it, so I, I will use this. But with give, get default I servers, then the user is actually setting this list, and that web app can optionally or not use um, that, that list. But since it's already there, it means that the user is already trusting these ICE servers. So why is the web app? Why does the web app should not use them? Um, how can it decide whether it's not to be trusted or, or to be trusted? The user is trusting this list because the browser is, is exposing this list. Mm. Well, look, you're, you're going to a step farther, which is this list should not be optional. It should be mandatory. You should have to use them. Right. Um, and I, I, look, I, though, though I appreciate that argument, I sort of agree. I think there was a lot of pushback on that argument. And it wasn't, it wasn't the one I was I, like, I just, I, that appeals to me at some level. But I think lots of apps are going to not work if you don't use their turn servers. Um, so in that case, I wasn't really quick, so I wasn't trying to win that argument. I don't. I, I mean, I'd support that, but I, it's not what I really care about. Personally, I'm I'm fine with uh, a user like I'm fine with Mozilla's approach, where Mozilla is a trusted one, and then a user is setting his parameters, and all websites will go through that because you know that's that's the way it is. Uh, I'm like. Like currently, we have proxies, and all the HTTP content will go through proxies, and that's fine. Uh, a website does not have to uh, opt in into going through a proxy. Uh, mm. It's 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 a browser that does it. So Look, why, why I, I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that argument if browsers were willing to do it, but I don't think they will be willing to implement that because of the websites they will break when they do that. So. Uh, I mean, if we could get that, I would say fine. We don't need this. But given we're unlikely to get that. I, or, or if we don't get that, then I come back to, I think we need a way for, for things to opt it in. And I agree, this is very much like opting into using a proxy. It's very similar. Mm. So, so, so Mozilla implements a behavior, uh, right? Which is not, which does not need any spec. So it seems like it's mostly evangelization from uh, enterprises to push uh, priority of implementing what uh, Firefox already implemented. Uh, somehow, and it's well. I mean, if you'd like to add to the WebRTC specs that that's required to be implemented as part of the security practice of this, that would be fine. But I don't think you'll get agreement on that. <laughs> but what I mean is that this API there will will not uh, give you a, anything more than something in the spec that might not be implemented. Uh, 
usually people implement things when they have um, um, people asking for those features. It's so far, at least on our side, maybe we have so many features that we're missing that. Uh, uh, well, I mean, several no major web providers web. of enterprise WebRTC software have requested this from all the web browsers. So I don't know what more we can say about that. Have requested this okay. API be implemented. <laughs> Right, I think Yuan's point was that um, having the API in the spec doesn't, the API does not mandate that you have to support default ice servers. It's just an API to get them if you if you implement. Them. Right. Yeah. I agree. So, so for instance, uh, I would be fine with something less granular, which would be um, a web app might want to know whether it will go through um, i servers by default, or or whether it does not want it. So like a Boolean saying, yeah, you will go from some turn servers that you don't know. And if you do not trust them, trust that, d don't do it. But that would be fine by me. And there, there's no privacy issues there. Uh, there's some fingerprinting, but it's less granular than a, a list of ice servers, for instance. But, and it's, why, I, I still, uh, why don't you make your application ask what the setting is from, from some web server or, or you know, if the user has to configure something, then why not why not make the configure part of the web app or yeah, as a web good. server or something? Like why does everything has to why does this that, have to be good. the same between between websites? Right. That's that's a good question. The, 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 but the reason we can't do that is because there's no way to, you know, Dynat like to like it's like this DNS SD thing I mentioned. The, the web server isn't going to allow us to put in some name that dynamically resolves to a different server depending on which enterprise you're currently in, right? Or, or you know who you are. So we're looking for some sort of dynamic way of of doing this, right? Like if I'm if I'm running WebEx at Ford or at um, BMW. Um, obviously, Ford's going to use Ford servers. BMW is going to use BMW servers to get through their firewalls, mm. um, but I need, I, you know, I, I can't have the app. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't try both or whatever. There's no way to really resolve that. I mean, we run into cores problems, right? Well, well, the the app can always, you know, fetch a setting from the web server. It can say the user that's logged in is uh, Amit at Ford, and then it goes to the app server and says, "What's the turn server?" And that can return the turn server for yeah. Ford. There's other ways to. Yeah, to but I understand it's, it's 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 not like Hangouts. From a privacy point of view, we don't require everybody to be logged in to use it. So you can join WebEx without being a WebEx user. Only the person that creates the WebEx conference. And this this has huge privacy implications for people. It's really good, um, but that's why we can't we can't drive it from the server. We'd also have an awful lot of websites that we were adding this to from a course point of view. So, so these were just you know initial suggestions. I, I would suggest that we start you know a thread specifically on this so we can figure out what the best way to go forward is. Well, uh, I think, I think that the, my current read is that I detect no consensus to remove at the moment, and we have to discuss this further. Should we should we state that as a result of the meeting and, and move on? Okay, sure. we can, uh, that, that we can do a list discussion. I, I'm looking. Should, should, should we put it at risk then? Well, if it's not, if it hasn't got any implementations, it would be yes. Yep. Colin, you were saying something. Yeah, I'm not worried about the at risk part or whatever. I'm I'm interested in what is it we can what is it that we can that browser vendors are willing to implement that would help solve the problem I have at hand. I don't care about this particular and, uh, API. I, I did check the bug trackers for Chromium and WebRTC, and none, and the word get default ice service doesn't occur in either. Well, um, <laughs> OK. <laughs> but that's not how we request stuff from any either of those two companies. So. Um, <laughs> No, uh, that's what that was one company. That that that's yeah. how that's how we keep track of what is being requested. That's why I say why I put it that way. Right. If if, if you requested it from from uh, Google and uh, uh, if you requested it from Google, then the request has been lost. Right. That's that's a very fair comment. Well, I guess one way to look at it is um, uh, which working group would answer. I mean. It, if it has, it seems like if it has an API, we ask this working group, and if it doesn't have an 
API, then maybe it's a different working group, or uh, or is it just a question for the vendors? Well, I, I think you still have to define how the whole thing works. There, the problem is in the issue, people were confused as to what it was supposed to do, even which may contribute to why they didn't implement it, right? If they didn't understand what it, what it was they were supposed to do. Well, um, we have discussed other ways to solve this in the past, and we've largely come around to that for various security and privacy reasons, there's not too many ways to skin this cat. Um, unless you wanted to make this mandatory behavior all the time, which several people did not want to do. Uh, well, like mandatory to use type. But, right. Sorry, I'm, mandatory is wrong. That, that if this, if one of these ICE servers, if one of these turn servers was configured, then the browser would always use that turn server regardless of what the app wanted. Right. If you're willing to accept that, then there are other ways to skin this cat, but people didn't want to do that. And that's how we ended up with this one. So I think it's reasonable to discuss what the options might be um, uh, in the current WebRTC working group, even though it might extend out broader to other places. And once we have an idea of what a solution looks like, then we'll know what the right places to go discuss it are. But this solution is pretty easy. <laughs> now, this thing, thing is pretty easy. Oh, that's good. Yeah. It's a feature, console feature. Okay, next question. Issue 2028 and PR 2069. Bernard. Okay, so this is this one is about set codec preferences and how it relates to RTX Red and FEC. Um, the two questions that came up were: uh, Can does set codec preferences affect RTX Red and FEC? Um, and then what happens if you end up with no codecs specified, like if you take out all the codecs except for RTX, RED, and FEC? Uh, does that result in an error? So in PR 2069, we basically say that uh, codec pre set codec references applies to all, co all codecs. So you can use it, for example, to remove RTX, RED, or FEC codecs if you want. Um, and it also says that if there's no proper codec specified, so if all you're left with is RTX read in FEC, then you'll throw in an invalid modification error. Uh, any objections to this? How would you reset the choices then? Like, uh -huh. get back to the default behavior. You can always set codec preferences with uh, an empty list, then you get the default behavior. Right. So the error is only if you have RTX, RED, or FEC codecs in there. No right. proper codecs. Yes. Well, uh, it's a little bit more than that, because it says, basically, if uh, you also get an invalid modification error if you attempt to, uh, if you're, uh, 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 basically, it, it looks at, uh, you have to have a, a valid offer regardless of direction. Um, so it looks at the intersection, and if you have no codecs at all, um, you'll also get invalid modification error. That's what it currently says. So uh, does that mean that if you if you call this with an empty empty set of codecs, you get uh, invalid modification error? Uh, uh, empty is magic value for no preference. But if you set this to be, if you can support sending VP8 but not receiving. VP8 and you set codec preference to only be VP8, it will throw an exception because you don't have a preference that is possible to use in the both in both uh, sending and receiving. No, I, I don't see the language that is uh, saying that an empty list is equals equals reset. Uh, it's step three on this page. Uh, oh. Yeah, it says if codex is an empty list, set transceivers preferred codex, slot to codex, and abort these steps. Yeah, and then there's in the create offer and create answer, there's there's a, there's a clause or within parentheses it says. Uh, so here's the uh, text that I was referring to. It says if the intersection between codex and get capabilities kind codex, or the intersection between codex and get capabilities of receiver uh, get capabilities kind is an empty set, then you throw an empty modifier. Uh, invalid modification error. Okay. So you always have to have something to offer. Anyway, so basically uh, the PR uh, modifies this to also say if it's uh, 
not just if it's an empty set, but if it's only RTX red and FEC codecs, you throw the invalid modification error. Uh, and and X step three is totally bogus. Uh, it says if codex is an empty list set, chance is preferred codex to slot the codex. Yes, uh, so, but in the create offering create answer, uh, there's a clarification what preferred codex means, uh, like what JSEP means by preferred codex, and the language says that. You know, there's steps of how to get the preferred codex based on this internal slot if it's present, or if if the preferred codex slot is the empty set, then you don't have any preference. Okay, then I get. It. Thank you. All right. So, uh, do we have a consensus to proceed with PR twenty sixty nine? Good. For, good for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, uh, next, Amit. Okay, um, so this one is about um, the way simulcast is currently written to, com to contain the um, streams that are going in both directions. Um, so so JSEP always shows examples that show something like two lines here, simulcast, send all these and then receive. And if you're the server, it says simulcast, send only the one layer and receive the other layers. Um, so this is... Actually, it, it that, has, that wasn't uh, from JSEP, that was from SDP simulcast, right? Yes, that one. Um, sorry, IEEE, I meant, sorry. Um, that one. Um, yes, so this introduces some complexity. Um, basically, it's the first time in uh, all of um, this negotiation where one side decides the identification for the other side. And there's no real benefit for this because, um, so the client, I'm gonna refer to the client as the one who's sending simulcast and the server as the um, forwarding unit. Um, so <clears throat> the client um, is the only one who needs to uh, identify what the um, RIDs they're sending are because th that's the only case where there are multiples and the server is always sending only one, one uh, stream. So there's no real need to, to identify that in the negotiation. Um, so what are the, so the values of this is only if you want to identify restrictions on the RIDs, right? So if you wanna say, hey, RID number four, which is the only RID that's gonna be sent by the server, that has, I'm gonna ask the server to do something with that, like limited to, to max size or something like that. But I think these were these were supposed to be in a different order. Um, one of the next slides is gonna is gonna talk about how these um, restrictions are not really sufficient, and that we don't really want to use them. Um, so basically, what you can say is you can you can move these restrictions because there's only one stream. You can move them to the FMTP lines or or in, or to other places. Um, so what so the suggestion is to only include the RIDs that are going from the client to the server. So if the client is the offer, it would say simulcast send and one, two, three, and nothing about what it's the name of the stream that it's going to receive, if any. And if the client is the answer, the server is going to send simulcast receive one, two, three, and nothing about what layer it's going to send. Is there a consensus on this? It's, uh, are there any objections to what Emmett just said? I think okay. it makes life simpler. Let's do it. Okay. I would mark it as wonderful. Um, Twenty fifty four. Yep. So there's a mismatch between the restrictions and the actual encoding parameters. So the restrictions lists a bunch of options, and it also says that you can register new options, um, but. Sorry, I heard something. Oh, that was the phone. Um, so it also says that restrictions must be respected, although it's possible that they are not understood by both parties. So if I say something like um, max width and um, whatever, another party does not support it, that's still fine. But what happens is that the entire line is, not, is going to be discarded. So if I say something like uh, um, max bit rate, max width, max height, and bit rate is not, is not um, understood, then I don't, get max height or max width either. It's sort of like an all or nothing. Um, 
restrictions are also limits. They're not actual values. So it, they don't really help me communicate um, what the layers are going to be. I can say that one of them is at most, I don't know, um, uh, 1,000, the next is 500, the last one is, is 300. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are, that these are the, the values that they are. It's just a top limit. Um, what else? They don't map to the send encodings. So especially how you specify which layer is what, right? So send encodings currently uses scale resolution down by and the um, restrictions seem to all use max width and max height. Um, uh, furthermore, right, if, if you restrict something with, uh, I don't know, uh, max width, max height, or let's say something that does match with the bit rate, th they can be disregarded. The user can call set parameters after negotiation to increase that um, uh, whatever was set. So there's no real way to enforce it long term. Um, well, um, so you can't do set parameters with something that goes against what's been negotiated. Right. Right, so you would get an, you'd have to keep track of it and, and so you could it. just throw an exception if, if you okay to so there's so, so yeah we can implement that in a way that would throw an exception if you try to do that agreed um, but yeah like I said it's also unclear how the layer configurations are communicated between the parties and it currently looks like all of that is off band is out of band signaling so what the suggestion is that we should not use restrictions in WebRTC you just indicate I'm sending, um, this read is going to be sent, this read is, is received without any restrictions that accompany that read. Um, as a consequence, what might happen is that you might not even need to signal reads at all because there's a simulcast line that all reads can be inferred from that simulcast line. I don't propose that. I, it's just something to keep in mind. I don't propose that because I don't want to get into the, into the, point where we're all removing the red lines and then if we find that hey you know what we do want to support something else in the future we're going to have this backwards compatibility nightmare where some you know some implementations will send the reds and others won't send the reds um, but basically it means that the a red lines are going to be redundant at the at the mm. if this is accepted are any objections Okay. The yeas have it. Well, I think it's a good idea. To say yeah. that. Simple. Another issue uh, 2061. Okay, continuing. So um, simulcast allows you to specify alternate alternate layers, right? And these don't really have an API surface for how we can specify them. So besides a theoretical point, there's no real way to implement it. So the way it looks like is it would say simulcast send one comma two, and then semicolon three comma four, and then you know, I gave five as the last layer. What this means is only three real layers, <laughs> but you know, one or two can be sent in the first layer, three or four can be sent in the next layer, and then the red lines would describe how these layers are are how these alternatives are different. But they but they they might be different in their codec, they might be different in their um, restrictions. Or they might be different in, you know, temporal versus spatial sampling, or things like that. Um, but there is no API surface to really support it, so I can't call set um, or add transceiver and give it send encodings and specify how these two layers are um, are alternatives for each other. Furthermore, it looks like there some of these in, in some of these scenarios there is a dependency. These are more configurations. So if it would be based on um, encoding, right, I would say I, I want to, you know, layers one, three, one and three are both the same codec and two and four are both the same codec. It won't make sense for, um, uh, for this, you know, for them to really be alternatives because um, using one and four or two and three are not really viable configurations. So I would say that there, there should be a different mechanism to, to do this, maybe sending to, maybe, I'm not saying that this is the right way, but perhaps sending another M section that says, hey, I can send you simulcast with, with this, or I can send you simulcast with this. Or if it's codex, I can actually put the codex on the top of the M, you know, of the M section, and you can just reject the codex that you don't want. So the suggestion is not to use alternatives and that they will, are not supported. 
Objections? Questions? Okay, the eyes have it. Aye. 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 Okay. Make it simple. Issue 2072, Harold. Okay, well, this is text I just uh, discussed. Uh, I, I was working on this, uh, this uh, red thing. And uh, from that, I had to put in text saying, here's how you create an a RTC R RTP sender uh, from a media description. And I found there wasn't such a place. So the easy answer is, uh, make such a place. I didn't get to write it up uh, before the meeting, but it should be simple saying that just put in a, a new section, new new paragraph next to create an R RTC RTP sender that says, create an RTC RTP sender from a media description and says, follow the JSON rules to extract the IDs you need and uh, create the tracks and streams and go for it. Mm -hmm. So, so you're just clarifying what uh, from media description means. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I think I've asked this myself. Like, what does this mean? <laughs> right. Yep. I mean, it's it's, it's a, so kind of obvious. It had to be there, but so it wasn't. Yep. So, if if everyone's okay with that, I'll just propose text. Uh, please do. Sounds good. Yeah, that's good. Wow. We reached the... Oh. Is that the end? This, this, is, the, yeah. this is the end. You oh, have to yeah. the next <laughs> Where do I send the, the notes? Uh, the mailing list? Or yep. The dog? Send it to the mailing list. Send All it right. to the mailing list. The answer is Bob. <laughs> okay. okay, then I will say thank you very much. And thank thanks you very for much, everybody. Being extremely okay. efficient. All right. Okay. Thanks, bye. 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 bye.